about the lack of an agreed definition because I think it all boils down to definitions. I've thought a lot about this um, <coughs> over the last few years and, uh, around this question of what does sustainable intensification mean because I was on a uh, foresight UK government uh, future of food and farming uh, commission which brought together a lot of people to discuss uh, what the next chapter of UK global agriculture should look like. And um, even though there was a 400 page report published, when it finally came out, and I didn't have prior sight of it, even though I was one of the people who was kind of around the table, because uh, it was all written by civil servants, as you can imagine, um, <laughs> there was no definition of sustainability in it. So I wrote to the people and said, look, you know, surely if you're going to talk about sustainable intensification, because it's really in that report that the, the, the term sustainable intensification was first coined, um, you've got to define your terms, because if you don't do it, you will end up with what Alan's just been discussing, a multiplicity of indicators and arguments and different voices, because it, it's all about language. If you use words, you need to define them. So I thought about this and mused about it, and I thought, well, this is interesting, because if I go back 41 years um, and ask myself the question, what drove me to start farming in West Wales? It was a desire to do the following things. And this is, this, this is a, an ongoing discussion, but what I think we wanted to do in our incredible naivety is a bunch of hippies that ended up there with, a, with a, you know, the end of a story which I haven't got time to tell you about, but some of you know anyway. Um, <laughs> it, it, we wanted to produce as much food as was consistent with the principle of preserving natural capital, of air and water, of biodiversity of soil. We wanted to minimize our use of non-renewable external inputs, of course, fossil fuels, other non-renewable inputs, and we wanted to build, oh, I'm sorry, they're, they're all going through, I do, I beg, do beg your pardon, they're not supposed to be doing this, but I'll get to the end this evening, and then, you, then you'll, uh, because I'll, I'll have to go through them again. Uh, so <laughs> can, can, can we get back to the when, when we get to the end of what I'm going to say, we run them again. Okay. Uh, we probably we, run through. We want to. Is it just on a loop? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, can we, can we stop it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a presentation. I think it's just a presentation. Yeah, well, I, I can't edit it. Okay. Well, we'll just we'll just let it run. But <laughs> we 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 want to address the issue of pollution to minimise pollution which of course means avoiding the use of fertilizers and pesticides, which we've done for 41 years on our farm. We want to address the, the question of systems resilience, make it minimize its, uh, its, its uh, vulnerability to external shocks. And we want to address the social and ethical and cultural dimensions, which means thinking about relocalizing, I think, food systems to protect against sudden external shocks and to take other question, other steps in relation to the scale of the farming system which will uh, ensure uh, that, uh, for instance, just to pick an example, our cows can walk to grass and back between milkings. It seems to me that's all about uh, uh, appropriate scale for sustainability. And I thought to myself that these principles actually define what we started to do initially before the development of organic stance, or more or less before the development of organic stance, and then subsequently um, they inform what we did. So I'll, I'll jump in now. I'm, I'm unfortunately, halfway through the cycle, but maybe we'll, I'll, let, no, I'll let it get to, get to its end. So we arrived there, and we, we set about doing that. We bought a foundation herd of 30 cows, and we started milking them, and we, and we moved in a very halting and still continuing way towards the system we've got today, which I thought I'd describe to you, and I'll have to go very fast, because this is on a six-second lapse or something. It'll be very difficult for me to to keep up with it, but I'll do my best, and that'll probably keep me to time. <laughs> uh, so, we have about 300 acres of land farm today. It's had no fertilizer or pesticides for 41 years. We're minimizing the use of veterinary products. We don't use um, antibiotics in the udder of our cows at all, because we're trying to promote positive health through good, sound husbandry. And of course, that's what the founders 
Yes, uh, we're obviously looking after biodiversity uh, and, and that's our farm pond, uh, which we swim in every day. This is a party to celebrate 40 years of the farm, which is something we were at. Right now we're at the beginning. My family. Two years ago, that's our new milking parlor. Uh, we've done a lot of capital investment in the last couple of years. Uh, here's our cows, now 85 airships, all the milk going to milk to make a single farm cheese called Havon and Cheddar Cheese. Uh, here are the cows. This, uh, this is most of these pictures are taken this year. We've done a lot of investment in uh, holistic grazing management because we have come rather late in life to the conclusion that uh, you build, you can build the fertility of soils by paddock grazing. So we we put in a mile of tracks, we put in electric fences, we put in water systems, and the aim is to mimic wild herds of herbivores, which is the Alan Savory's observation, which gave rise to his principle of holistic grazing. We, through that, we've realised we can take our productivity of our pastures to another level. We, it's all based on clover, of course, that was a field of dandelions. There's an interesting discussion about the role of weeds and what they play in the system. We cut uh, the legs of the silage. We, uh, it, it, we, we're producing this year, it, we, our aim is to be as self-sufficient as possible in our forage, in our bedding. This is oats and peas, which we grow and feed in the form of muesli for our cows because we're trying to be self-sufficient in... Um, not only nutrients, nutrient cycling, but also animal feed and bedding. So we're growing oats and peas, we're rolling into the Danish roller mill, feeding it to the cows, suckling it to give it concentrates. We're now more than 50% of our concentrate uh, ration growth on the farm. That's the combine, that's the harvester actually last year. And here's the straw. Uh, we, in addition to um, straw for bedding, we also bale rush hay from the holding the road called Havon, and that was the, the rush hay bale this summer, which we're using for bedding for the animals in winter. And here's the cows coming in for milking. <coughs> and um, the milk is in, in this milking parlour, which interestingly was the parlour of Rachel's dairy. That's a social question, of course. Of course, Rachel's dairy went out of milk, so we got their older breast parlour. That's my son, Ben, hopefully the next generation of milkers. Um, is he enjoying it? It's a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> There's my older son, Sam, his wife, Rachel, the cheese makers. And uh, it, we're now making over a thousand litres a day uh, into cheese, and very little uh, milk is being exported. This is our attempt to improve our nutrient cycling, and there's the finished product which only got roofed about two weeks ago. We're hoping that that will morph into an anaerobic digestion, because of course we're interested in renewable energy, and that's one of the aims of the farm. Uh, I advise JCB, my two sons love, love that machine, I love it too. It's amazing how it's transformed our capacity to um, handle. There's, there's the farm party at the end of last year. So we can, we can hold that now, rather than it just going on. So the point I suppose I'm making is that what I'm trying to do is sustainable intensification. Because we're trying to produce as much food as possible from <coughs> using a system which is adhering to the definition of sustainability. And it struck me that when many people in this room started working on the development of organic standards, that's exactly what we were doing. And the principles behind the standards are, in fact, our attempt to define sustainability. Now, we might not have got it right, but I think that uh, our definitions of principles are still in the arena of what uh, should inform the development of best farming practice into the future. And so... I concluded that, unlike what Alan said, I think actually that sort of system does fully adhere to the principles of sustainable intensification. And in my opinion, the use of, of chemicals is inconsistent with one of the principles that I set out earlier, and therefore uh, would not um, adhere to the definition if we define it properly. So there's one of the discussion points. But I, but I will come back to that because I think that um, one of the problems that we've got with the organic standards at the moment is that we've made them rigid, you are or you aren't, and because of that we've uh, made it more difficult for people to move up to embrace the idea of a set of metrics which define sustainable practice and to move up the, the ladder in time, but I'll come back to that. Um, what I wanted to go to before I do that is to share with you my thoughts on soil, and to do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a book, which is called...
called missing microbes. And this is really my new gut feeling about soil. So this is what's happened to me in the last couple of years. I read this book, Missing Microbes, by Martin Blazer. It's just a little distraction, but it won't take long. This guy is director of the Medical Center at New York <coughs> University. And he became interested in the human biome, which many of you will know about. Uh, it's a fact that there are three times as many organisms in our body as there are cells, most of them in our gut, coexisting with us in a symbiotic way, playing a vital role in our digestion. They are not passive. And this guy became interested in this, uh, this uh, biome and what we've done to it during the 21st century, 20th and 21st century, specifically in, in relation to the use of antibiotics, but not exclusively. And he... What is interesting is that each of us in this room has a unique stomach biome. So mine is different from every one of yours, even though most of the bacteria in and the fungi and all the other things in our biome are the same species. But our sort of fingerprint of our biome is unique to us. And it is established, it's primed at birth. And it's primed by the vaginal and fecal bacteria, uh, which a natural birth will uh, coat the vernex, the skin of the baby with, and therefore prime its digestive system. And one of the things that um, Martin Blazer looked at, he looked at cohort studies of C-section births and vaginal births. And he's now traced that there are differences in the subsequent biology of the gut, which lasts for right through life. And if you look at uh, health studies of C-section babies, they are different. And in some countries, it's now up to 40% of babies are C-section. He then looked at antibiotics. In America, I think it's five or six courses of prescribed antibiotics have been taken by most children aged five or six, and it's up to about 20 by the age of 18. And he came up with this hypothesis. If antibiotics are killing off our stomach bacteria, the clues in the name, antibiotic, uh, surely that would, might have a similar effect to the use of antibiotics for growth promoters in livestock. So he found a cohort of children that had fed, been given no antibiotics uh, as, as children. And he compared them with the ones that had anti antibiotics. And uh, guess what? There was a 20% increase in obesity in the children that had the antibiotics and the ones that hadn't. And then he looked at allergies and he looked at autism. He looked at a whole range of things. So this is guys that are a very eminent scientist in New York. And he, he came to the conclusion uh, that there was a direct linkage between what we are doing to our stomach bacteria in this age of antibacterialness, which is a sort of viral infliction which everyone has been seized by, um, and negative health outcomes which are costing billions and billions and billions of dollars or pounds throughout the world. Now this relates to, this going back to my gut feeling about uh, soil, <laughs> David Wilson, who's sitting at the back, said to me a few years ago, he said, you know, somebody said to me, we should think about the soil as being like the stomach of a plant. I thought that was very interesting, because it was pointed out that plants don't have a stomach, but they do in a way, because they have their root system, where they spend 30% of their energy exuding sugary saps into the root zone, which nourish a symbiotic community of bacteria and fungi, and the bacteria and fungi digest the humus and release the nutrients upon which the nutrition of the plant depends. And of course, our standards require soil-based nutrition. Well, I thought about that, and then in the light of this thing that Martin Blazer has been, uh, I read about in this book, and some more uh, lectures I heard about the human biome, I suddenly realized that, of course, the, the stomach is a metaphor, for, a, and it's a passageway to understand soil in a new way, in, in the same way that I'm now feeling a completely different emotional relationship with my own stomach, because I've understood this <laughs> extraordinary, miraculous nature of what's going on inside it, which I can feel good about, not bad about. And, you know, I, I eat, which means I feed my stomach bio. Uh, it changes from day to day, as we all know, and, and the result is a healthy organism or an unhealthy organism, and that's what's happening on a massive level. And exactly the same thing is happening in agriculture. So think of the soil of planet Earth like a vast collective stomach of all the plants on Earth. And then think of yourself as a farmer walking <coughs> over your soil. You're walking over the stomach of the Earth. It's a beautiful idea. It's what I found it beautiful. It's completely transformed my relationship with the soils of my own farm. I've realized that my stewardship of the soil 
My management of the soil is absolutely critical to maintaining its health. It's what I add, it's the bacterial status of a rubbish composter. Many people in this room, including Nick, will confirm this. He's always had a go at me about poor manure management. As you can see, I'm on, the, on an improving course now. But <laughs> composting, particularly of live, from livestock farmers, is going to be critical, I think, to develop bacterial status to improve soil fertility. And it needs to be taken up by farmers all over the world. I've just been in Kyrgyzstan, where they're just at the beginning of a new chapter of agriculture. And I've concluded that what Howard said when he went to India and he set up all this <coughs> interesting stuff, that's the revolution that's needed in the world now. It's all about soil, it's about biology, it's not about chemistry, and it's about us getting better at building soil fertility. The whole thing is actually about that. And of course, as Peter Sega continuously reminds me, 2015, year of the soil, we need to do so much during this year. We, are, we the Sustainable Food Trust, are going to the Berlin conference, two conferences in Europe, and uh, we will certainly be focusing on soil during the 2015 year. So it's a critical thing uh, to think about soil. And then I want to talk briefly about the role of ruminants, because ruminants have had a very bad press. They emit methane, and they seem to be very inefficient. But in fact, ruminants will form a central part of the development of sustainable food systems uh, throughout the world, not in every single situation, but in most situations, because it's only ruminants that can digest cellulose, and if we have 100% grass or forage-fed ruminants, then they are part of the solution, not part of the problem, because they uh, are the only way that we can turn that fertility building phase into food, plus the fact that they are critical in building soil fertility. So ruminants are going to play a very central part in building the future that we need. Now, We've done all the stuff that we've done on this organic movement, and I mentioned earlier that we developed the organic standards in the 80s. I actually wrote the first draft of the dairy standards as part of the livestock standards committee, and then it got sort of amalgamated to the UPROS and to the EU and to the National Organic US Program, etc. But in relation to what Alan has said, it seems to me that one of the problems with the organic standards, even though they're based on 100% the right principles, is they've created this threshold, which we do need for a market entry, if you are or you're not. And this has become institutionalized, and a whole lot of ongoing thinking, all about sustainability, actually, if, if we're prepared to use the word, and I do use the word, though, I don't use the O word as much as I use the S word, because I, I'm convinced that if we want to join the debate about sustainability, we have to hold them to account on a definition of terms, which means that these measurements, poor measurements, which uh, Alan is referring to, are accurate against the right sustainability principles. But what we've done, because we've focused very much on what the threshold is between you are organic or you're not organic, is we've had, it's had the unintended consequence of alienating a whole lot of people who are not organic. And it's enabled people, like Alan, to say, well, of course, you're dreaming if you think everybody's going to be organic, which in a way is right, when in fact what we need to be saying is everybody should be on this ladder towards more sustainable production. And we need a set of metrics based on sustainability principles and characteristics, which would enable us to measure on an ongoing basis our degree of sustainability. So if you take my own farm, sorry, it all went a bit screwed up there, but basically, if I was to turn back and look at my own photographs again and assess my, capacity, my, my compliance with sustainable intensification, I'd be very critical about it. I'd say, our manure management is bad, our nutrient cycling has been leaky. Uh, our yields vary, as again was just said, uh, enormously in our grain fields. Why? Because our soil, our soil biology is not right in all the fields. So I want to measure myself next year against what I did next year, last year. And I don't really want the inspector to talk about non-compliances. I want to know personally whether I'm better this year than I was last year. <coughs> I want my sustainability quotient to increase. Now, of course, I want market access, and I want my milk to go when it isn't making cheese to go to Rachel's dairy, so I'm going to have to comply with a certain minimum entry point, and I recognise that. But I think the psychology of this is important, because the organic movement has, we've enabled ourselves to be marginalised from this debate. We've pushed ourselves into a, you're the organic sector, and the rest of us are having, us are having a debate about sustainable intensification. We were always having a debate about sustainable intensification, right back to the beginning. We just got sidetracked in, rightly at the time, into thinking that we had to get all the additional income that we needed from uh, a special market where people would pay more from our products. And now we're seen as being elitist and middle class and all the rest of it. And the reason for that 
is because we forgot something fundamental. And this is the other thing I wanted to say to you about true cost accounting. We forgot that the current systems of intensive farming do not put a price or do not put a value on the negative externalities arising from the wrong practices. So if you take a kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer, which costs about a euro, the farmer uses the kilogram and gets a three euro benefit. So there's a business case for using nitrogen fertilizer. If you cost in all the negative externalities which arise from the use of that kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer, it's at least three euros. And some people are saying it's as much as nine euros, but it's not costed. So we need to have a set of metrics categories of externalities which cover all the bases, natural capital, pollution, social and cultural, public health, the biggest of all probably, if you were to cost in the obesity and the antibiotics resistance and the diabetes and the allergies and the cancers which are arising from poor agricultural and food system practice, we would, and put all that on the price of the farming system which is now the predominant model, you'd reverse the economics. Now, I didn't personally think of this until quite recently. I thought that we had to develop a separate organic market and see the market pay the difference because I hadn't realized these, the incredible scale of the economic distortions which arise from our present farming system and the failure to cost in both the positive and the negative externalities because it's not all negative. If you think about carbon, <coughs> uh, Professor Sir Gordon Conway, who I was in a dinner with in London on Sunday night, he said, you know, I think carbon is probably a proxy for a whole lot of stuff in the soil. If only we could measure, in, including the biology that we were talking about, if only we could measure it, then we would have a means of paying farmers to be carbon stewards. And that would be the transforming thing. What we really need is an app which we can sort of press into our soil and read off the soil carbon. Because we need to assess the degree of the soil carbon outcome of different farming systems and be able to know whether our systems are building soil carbon or not. And if they are building soil, soil carbon and an organic and a carbon market develops, then our, that organic carbon in the soil would have a value and our farming systems would be rewarded economic. And that would be an example. And I agree with you, Alan, most of the most of the tools are there for you know the policy measures. They're just pushing things in the wrong direction. So we need to summarize. We need a new set of metrics, many of which are already in our possession because we've been working on this for decades. The metrics need to be used in two ways. They need to be ways used firstly to enable us to define our progress. And in my opinion, by the way, these metrics could be used to assess organic systems as well. So you could overlay a new system of metrics on the existing biodynamic, organic, dare I say it, red tractor, leaf, any other mark you like, because you could say, well, let's use the sustainability uh, indicator to assess the system, and it'll get a score. And you could have thresholds for organic. You can have you know, a minimum score of 70 and no pesticides, no GMOs. You can still have an organic market. It's not ruling that out. It's just it's the psychology of it. You need a ladder towards better practice. Everyone's on it. No one's off it. <coughs> celebrating success. There are examples. I mean, the arguably, the food for life catering market is one of those. It needs to be more sophisticated. It needs to be more uh, accurate in measuring what's good and what's bad. But it's the principle that I think is important. And interestingly enough, with true cost accounting, it's many of the same metrics that we would need to use to assess the externalities, both positive and negative, which arise from different farming systems, which could then be used as a means of making sure that we redirect the subsidies, we tax nitrogen fertilizer, to give an example, we pay farmers to be carbon stewards, and we also use the market mechanism, because there will continue to be market failure. It's not all going to be done by a redirection of subsidies and taxes, because in many economies in the world that mechanism simply doesn't exist. But if we were to do that, then we would, I think, have a transformative effect on the sustainable agriculture movement, because, as Alan rightly says, if we're only 5% and all food and farming needs to move towards more sustainable practice in very short order, we, the sustainable food movement, have to be aware that if there are deficiencies in our mindset, in our, in our system assessing sustainability, which have become institutionalized over all these years, and now the times are changing, and we have to change with them, then we need to think about how we're going to do that. And we need to be prepared to abandon some of our, you know, deeply felt beliefs and kind of self-reinforcing stuff, and take a risk 
and go out and talk to these people out there because basically they're well-meaning people and help them to get on, or help ourselves and them to create a system which is inclusive, not exclusive, and enables everybody to get on the ladder.